All right. It is 6 p.m. on the dot, and we will get going with tonight's webinar. Um, thank you very much for joining me tonight and spending your evening, or some of your evening, and hopefully just a half an hour to about 45 minutes as well. Um, I'm going to try to keep this in that time frame. Um, if you have any questions, please just go ahead and enter it into the chat. I'll try to just give you an answer or give you my thoughts on that um, when I'm able to transition uh, from a slide, from one slide to the next slide, um, just so I can keep like all my thoughts coherent in, in what I'm doing and where I'm at. Um, so we'll get going. People will probably be filtering in as well, um, but I'd like to start to respect our time frame as well tonight. So to, be, to get going today, today we're going to be talking about three ways, three healthy habits and ways to embrace these healthy habits during uncertain times. Um, we're going through a very, very unprecedented time period. Um, and from what, what I've been seeing clinically as well is that people are sort of getting used to this new normal. Um, we were seeing a lot of spike in people with panic symptoms, people with anxiety, um, people really struggling with the fear and the uncertainty. Now what we have is a little bit more of these depressive symptoms coming from isolation, coming from being cut off from loved ones, even though we're able to access them through our screens, we're not able to be around them, we're not able to observe birthdays, holidays, weddings, et cetera. And, and that's starting to take its toll on people, especially as we're coming into the summertime. So I wanted to give sort of a presentation, a webinar tonight on what are some healthy habits that I feel like are sort of like, as it could be as important and, and as beneficial as something like um, brushing our teeth every day, um, getting out of bed and making our bed. These little things that we can do every day that can help us feel very, very calm and embedded in our life. And a lot, these three healthy habits today are going to be a little bit more focused on emotional awareness, emotional processing, and also emotional cultivation, trying to cultivate different states by providing uh, and facilitating uh, an environment that gives us the emotions that we want to have. And so we'll get going here, start moving through. And I've first a little bit about me. My name is Jacob Meyer. I'm a LSW, so that's just like a general therapist licensure, um, as well as an LAC, which is a, a master's level addiction counselor. Um, I got my start in this field working in addiction and trauma at Behavioral Health Group Westminster for almost, almost three years, two and a half, three years there. Um, and that was sort of a trial by fire type of experience, walking into very um, high need patients, patients that are suffering from addiction, traumas, polysubstance abuse, um, a lot of people experiencing homelessness, things of that nature. And so definitely got used to a very, very intense part of the field. Um, and my role at IHS has sort of grown into treating chronic illness, traumatic brain injuries, and sort of supporting the integrated approach at integrated health systems. And one of my primary functions at the clinic um, during these assessment periods are I, I'm here to sort of see what what is what is the person's emotional health in that snapshot. When you meet with me, you're going to be meeting for about a half an hour, uh, 20 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever that might take to sort of get that good picture. But it's a very conversational approach, and I'm sort of there to pick up on what are you coming in with, but also what is the state of your emotional health in relationship to the symptoms that you're coming in with. Um, a lot of people. Um, are sort of surprised to see me when they they are going through the assessment. But what we do find there, why Dr. Stedman um, has added me to the team and wants to keep a counselor on the team is because someone's emotional health, specifically how their body is experiencing stress, um, is can be a significant barrier to their overall recovery. Um, and he thought it would be a good idea to have someone in-house because you end up referring out to, to a good therapist, but then they have the nasty habit of typically being fully booked. Um, and so my role at IHS is not only to provide individual therapy, um, to, to be able to provide pa patients individual breath work if they feel like individual therapy, um, either they're not ready for it or they don't need that level um, of assessment and, and work, I'm there to support the rest of the team and collaborate with them and, and help sort of deal with 
um, maybe some miscommunications that might happen and help the patient sort of express where they're coming from as well. And really um, got into this field. Um, I worked at a school just out of undergrad um, and I really learned there, you know, what, what is the power of connection? What's the value of connection? And how, when you simply provide a good connection to, let's say, parents with a, with a troubled child or a troubled child, you, you provide a very consistent and forthright approach with them, that they, they tend to exhibit the most positive behaviors. That, that really captured my imagination. Um, I was able to sort of break in and work with uh, more highly demanding, a more highly demanding student population on the South Side of Chicago for a couple of years. And that, that experience for me was very transformative and led me into like graduate work and, and, and coming out to Colorado as well. So with that about me, you know, my, my, all of my work, I feel just from just right out of undergrad and, and as well, going into addiction therapy, my experiences and my internships and my professional experience as well um, has really um, informed my approach at integrated health systems. But I've also been able to grow a lot and understand and, and mold to what the patients are dealing with and specifically dealing with the chronic illness, traumatic brain injuries, things of this nature. And, and a lot of what we see is just a lot of chronic stress that's coming through our doors, um, especially during this time currently. And so sort of moving forward into the overview of what we're going to be talking about today, these healthy habits, and also how we will be able to form them. Uh, the three habits we're talking about are mindful breathing, emotional processing, and empathy and self-compassion. And what I want everyone to understand, a big takeaway um, I want to really emphasize probably throughout this presentation today is that the habits and their formation, the formation process of the habits are as equally as important as each other. Um, I can tell you all day, um, and I might talk your off all day, especially if you're in the office, about what are the benefits of mindful breathing. I mean, I'm very, very passionate about this approach. Um, it, it's very informed and embedded in my individual therapy. Um, I, I truly believe in the power of emotional processing. How can we allow emotions to move through us? How can we capitalize on growing awareness that we experience? Um, cu cultivating states of the habit of building empathy and self-compassion. These are all very critical um, habits that we can have that are very, very beneficial for us. But if we're not able to embed them and live and embody these habits, on a, a, a almost daily basis, I would say, or um, at the very least a weekly basis, we are simply not going to be able to access their benefits. So I want you to think about sort of the metaphor of a farmer or, or a gardener. And I want you to try to understand these habits as the fruit. You know, we can eat this, we can, uh, they provide a sustenance, um, they help us sort of grow and live and survive. And the formation of the, of these fruit, of this harvest, of these habits is the habit formation process in that self. It's very hard to eat, let's say, an apple, a piece of corn, something of that nature, if we don't know how to grow it. We need to know how to grow these habits, embed them, imbue them into our daily life so then we can then access the benefits from them. Um, and you cannot access these benefits without understanding how to form them. And talk on um, habit form formulation um, will be simple, but I don't, but simple is not easy. Simple requires um, a lot of consistent effort, um, intentional sort of awareness and, and planning into our daily structure. So a great book that I sort of derived um, that I pulled some, some of these principles from um, it are from James Clear. He's the author of Atomic Habits and just a great book, um, and you can even get most of the benefits of that book from getting uh, like Atomic Habits. If you Google in Atomic Habits and Cheat Sheets, um, it has all like the behavioral principles that are aligned behind it. I've included some of those in here today, but I want us to really focus on how can I just keep this as simple as possible with habit formation? How can I make it easy? And how can I embed this into pre-existing daily structures? And so just to sort of start on um, 
where we're at with these habits and to sort of give you an overview. Um, we'll start with mindful breathing on the top left here. And mindful breathing, again, I, I can talk about this um, for, for a long, long time, but you would be really surprised at how often I, I see patients and how little understanding they have of their emotional states from a day-to-day -day perspective. It's very, very normalized to be distracted within our culture. It's very, very normalized to have our attention moving from one place to another, sort of ping-ponging around all day. And we don't tend to check in with things like our breath, things like how our body feels. And developing this habit of mindful breathing, um, this skill, this great piece of fruit that we can sort of benefit from is is sort of the key to this process. How can we start to get into that state more? How can we spend more time and effective time in that state so we can cultivate what we want? And there's just a ton of positive evidence pointing towards increased health in not only the body, but also the mind. And a lot of this, I'm not gonna get into too much detail right now. I'm gonna cover a little bit more on guided meditations in the next slide, but the, what, what essentially the principle behind this is, is that our, we are able to intentionally access and manipulate our autonomic nervous system. We're able to get into that parasympathetic nervous system, which is our rest and digest state, and sort of downregulate our sympathetic ner nervous system, our fight and flight state. And the parasympathetic nervous system is sort of one of the newer developments in, in human development and specifically with social mammals. And what that helps us do is to downregulate feelings of anxiety, um, feelings of uh, like predator detection, things like that. So we can upregulate things like social bonding and pro-social behavior as well. And so this is a very powerful system we have, and, and both are good and bad in their own ways. I would never tell someone that a fight and flight state is bad, let's say if they're up in, up in the mountains here and, and hiking and a bear jumps out. You know, you're going to really want that heavy cortisol release, the heavy adrenal dump, because you're going to need to probably run for your life or fight for your life very, very quickly. So th these things are not good or bad. They're simply they give us positive and positives and benefits overall. If we're stuck in our parasympathetic state and we're very calm, let's say if a bear or, or, or cougar jumps out at us, that, that's not the most beneficial thing for our short-term survival. So none of these states are, are good nor bad. They have benefits both in the short term, um, but or and also benefits in the long term. But our parasympathetic state is typically better for our long-term health and our sympathetic state being better for our short-term health with trade-offs in between there. And sort of moving on here to emotional processing, like, like mindfulness, emotional awareness and processing is the skill. And the, one of the big principles behind this is being able to differentiate what we're feeling in this moment, a, a very large practice of mindful breathing skills what we're able to differentiate of what we're experiencing right now rather than what we're embodying currently and this is a this is a little can be a little bit of a tricky concept but it, we can break it down with some simple metaphors that, that there is a very profound difference when someone is angry at you yelling at you very very upset embodying that emotion and the difference between someone saying hey i'm feeling angry right now when you do this, I feel this way. It's much more, you can even feel my tone changing as I'm describing it. It's much more calm. The person is able to contain the emotion and the person is not allowing this emotion to simply take them over and where they will feel disempowered by this emotion. Oftentimes in the long term, we all have a person in our life that has struggled with anger. And when we're feeling really disempowered by an emotion like anger, sadness, anxiety, we tend to feel a lot of shame afterwards because we start blaming ourselves, And we, but there's this struggle in understanding where where is my awareness point of anger, sadness coming into my body, what can I do to now change this behavior to separate myself from the stimulus and so I feel more empowered by the situation and not the other way around. And, and the last thing we'll cover today is cultivating empathy and compassion and specifically kindness to others and ourselves. And so empathy is sort of stepping into the feelings of others. 
It's trying to be curious and understand what they're going through in that moment. And compassion is a little bit different than that. So empathy, we're not trying to really solve any problem. We're simply trying to connect and understand. And when a person is connected with and they feel understood, now we have the power of this connection. They don't have to bear this in isolation. A, a big sort of principle that I work by is that we human beings are finite creatures and through connection, we can bear an incredible amount of pain and stress. But in isolation, that, that, uh, that amount of stress is very, very finite. It's far less and we will become overwhelmed by the stressors we're experiencing if we feel cut off from others, if others cannot see and feel what we are experiencing currently. And so this connection, the empathetic connection is a very, very powerful, very foundational tool in therapy. Um, it's very foundational to healthy relationships overall. And compassion is sort of a step beyond that. We're, we're putting a value judgment on compassion. We're saying, hey, I like it when someone is, when I'm suffering or someone else is suffering and I choose to be compassionate, I choose to give them kindness. We're saying that this is a good thing with something like indifference being more neutral and cruelty being bad. And, and the question I'd like you all to ask yourselves, and, and this sort of goes in with, with all these habits and their formation, is what states would you like to cultivate within your life? If we understand and, and, and can become aware of ourselves, now we have choices that are on the table that we might not have understood even existed before. Um, it, it's very, very interesting to see somebody go through this process of be, becoming empowered through not constantly walking into emotions and being caught up in that wave, being sort of grabbed by that. But once they're aware and can work with these emotions, they can start to understand, ah, I can live in a way that can cultivate emotions that I would like, more compassion, good feelings towards myself and others, a more empathetic approach. Others understand that I see and am curious about their emotional states, the, the value of emotional processing, being able to become aware and allow something to move through you. And um, something that's very tied in closely with mindful breathing as well. So we are really moving into a time where our understanding of the body and the mind are increasing and increasing by the year. And a big style of therapy that I have is helping the person cultivate states that they want, and that is providing the environment for the emotions to grow in, just like a plant talking about before. We have to provide a, a specific environment and a consistent basis, and we will typically get emotions that we want a little bit more, that are more satisfactory to our overall our overall health and make us feel empowered in, in our daily life. So with that overview, we're gonna be moving into some basics on mindful breath work. And I want to give you all things that are sort of, uh, these, are, these are more high impact um, habits um, and formations. They're very simple, but they give you a lot of return on your investment. And one of the biggest things with mindful breath work that I do with people, let's say in the office or when I provide sort of like half hour psychoeducational mindfulness break based breath work um, to help people teach and understand that and embed them in their daily life is that a focus meditation, closing your eyes, focusing on your breath, noticing when your attention is wandering and non-judgmentally bringing yourself back to your breath. That focus style of meditation, very, very popular, very, very effective, is a lot of times too much of a skill for someone to simply learn on their own. And so a, a way around this where we can still start to experience the benefits of meditation immediately, being able to ground ourselves to a calm state where we're accessing and spending more time in our parasympathetic nervous system. It's harder to do that simply on our own. It's a lot easier if we have an external voice guiding us through the process. And we need to understand that meditation is a skill that's being derived. Um, it's been used for thousands and thousands of years. Um, it stayed embedded in humanity, and we're now just able to study it and, and sort of understand so many benefits that it gives us. Um, and so 
what I encourage people to do definitely in, in this webinar right now is to download an app. Um, the one I use, uh, I don't have any specific preferences, it's just the one I downloaded first and I've stuck with it because it works for me, is the Insight Timer app. There's also a great app called like Calm, there's also Headspace, um, and I'm sure there, there are many others that are very, very effective, but what I do like about this Insight Timer app is that it has a library of literally thousands of, excuse me, thousands of guided meditations. And we can use these meditations as, you know, um, meditations that promote sleep, um, loving kindness meditations, self-compassion meditations, grief and loss meditations, depression-based meditations. So we can get a message that's tailored to us. But the, the important thing that meditation brings us to is how can we become more and more aware of our bodily states, of our breath, and help us be more in tune with our emotions. During meditation, you are often going to be encouraged to notice what is happening within you, to notice what is happening with your body, something that people simply do not spend a lot of time doing in our very fast-paced day-to-day lives. And so with understanding that guided meditations are sort of this shortcut and that we still need to be able to do this consistently, but this is simply the fastest road I, I've found um, in, in work in my practice um, with patients is that we need to still make this a habit. And one of these first principles that I want you to understand is that when we're going out and starting the habit, we need to make it as easy as possible, as easy as possible. I would rather have someone do five one minute guided meditations during the weeknights than one five minute meditation once a week. Why is this? Because we are building compliance first. We are getting used to the ritual. And once we build compliance, now we can add in and easily um, up the intensity. Okay, I did, I did um, let's say I have a patient that's beginning and they set a goal um, of five, um, five minute meditations um, between the next week when they see me. If they're getting those five repetitions, they're making a ton of progress already. And it, it, I want you to think about it like this. When oftentimes when people go to the gym or there's a new a New Year's resolution that happens, people think they need to work, um, go and get a full workout for an hour and a half to two hours. Um, and they typically exhaust themselves because they're going more in in the intensity first mindset rather than just building compliance. The people that will still be there the next January or in July are the people that are going to simply come even as short as 20 minutes at a time, slowly embedding this into their routine and, and, and getting results day after day. So this first principle of habit formation is to make it as easy as possible. I want you to select probably a shorter guided meditation and to select an easier time and, and to understand that this the, one of the easiest times that we can embed this into is something like when we go to sleep when our mind typically wanders, where a lot of people struggle with anxious and ruminating thoughts. And so we, we have that easy mindset, start low and go slow, but also to try to embed it into a pre-existing ritual, which will have some redundancy through this um, presentation right now, because all these things sort of melt together. So the first principle to understand is to simply make it as easy as possible make it fun, make it very relaxed, and just to build compliance in your habit formation. And moving on to emotional processing, which it, it ends up being very, very similar to mindful breath work, where through emotional processing and specifically through a very tried and true and evidence-based method of uh, journaling or emotional writing or emotional jour journaling um, is to help us develop that awareness. If we're able to, let's say, even write in a journal what emotions we experienced um, over a week, even for five minutes at a time, I was sad today, um, I was happy today, I was angry today, um, I struggled today, Think things of this nature, very, very basic, we're able to develop awareness of our emotional states and how we move through them over time. We can track our progress. And once we become aware of these states, we can utilize this awareness to make changes. We can start making some educated guesses on 
what is affecting us, how we cycle through emotions, and what we can start to do differently to start to cultivate the emotional experiences that we prefer. And so I want us to think about journaling in this. And when, again, when we start to track behavior, we can start to pick out patterns. And again, when we start to pick out these patterns, we can start making these educated guesses. Once we know, now we can change. And so sort of an example of this, a very, very common one, is people that experience something we like to call the Sunday scaries. Sunday is supposed to be a day of rest, a day of recovery, a day where, you know, people aren't moving around too much. You might have a meal with a friend, something very basic, but we're sort of prepping and getting ready for the work week. But a lot of people will notice that there's sort of a feeling of dread that will come in. With all the space we now have, we're now starting to feel a little bit more relaxed. We can start to feel anxious about the week. You would be very surprised at the amount of people that have no awareness that not only that this is a very normalized behavior by them, but that this is very common for people to experience at large. And so other things that we can start notice, how do we feel when we're ending work, when we're transitioning away from our screens right now or before and, and after all the stuff that we're going through right now, how do we feel when we hit the door, when, when we come home? How are we greeted? How do others make us feel? How do my emotions flow through my day? Once we can grow this awareness and track what's happening, then we can start to make some changes and cultivate the experiences that we want. And so like with mindful breathing, the, one of the major principles that is at work with journaling is how do we start becoming aware, but also differentiating emotions from the self. Journaling provides us another opportunity to start differentiating, differentiating these emotions and thoughts. And so once this concept is really understood, that then we can understand that we are simply experience, experiencing thoughts and emotions and that we are not, again, that we are not our thoughts and emotions. We can sort of come back to the example that I provided earlier of someone who is expressing anger, is intentional about anger and its effect on them um, in a conversation versus someone simply lashing out, embodying anger in that moment. And so once we can start differentiating and start noticing and watching and being curious about our internal states, then we can start making some changes. We can notice, hey, Whenever I talk to this person at work, for whatever reason, I become pretty angry and I don't want to feel that way anymore. What do I need to walk into this situation if this is someone I need to deal with? Or how can I avoid engaging with this person so I can have the emotional experience that I want and that I am comfortable with? And so once we're able to differentiate, once we're able to notice and get some of these principles down, then we're able to start making some of these changes. And so what I want you to understand this process, the mindful breathing and the journaling, journaling sort of end up blending together a lot. Um, and I typically use both um, to grow awareness and to help people track and build content in between sessions um, that they could come in with and work through. But we also need to understand how can we build this as a habit. And what the principle I want to express right now is that we can stack this with existing habits. Um, we, I sort of alluded to that a little bit before. We're talking about adding in something like a guided meditation before we go to bed. We go to bed, like it or not, every single night. Um, to, mostly, I mean, typically people will go to bed on most nights of their life. I mean, there are a few people who push that limit a lot and the, the health outcomes are not very good for that. So I would definitely recommend going to sleep every night. And so even with sort of a silly example like that, we can understand that, hey, I do have to go to bed every night. That is a, a, a significant and specific cue that I have probably around between the hours of 9 p.m. and, and 12 p.m. We're, we're starting to fall asleep. We're starting to want to go to bed. So that's just one existing habit that we have during our day. Um, we have bedtime rituals. We have brushing our teeth. We have getting home, um, going out, going for a walk, working out. We have cooking dinner and we have putting the kids down. And so I want you to understand in this stacking, we can, um, before we go to bed, we can add in a habit, spending five minutes journaling, um, spending five minutes in a guided meditation, um, 
when we brush our teeth, we can do a guided meditation after that. When we get home, then we can do this other activity. And when we start to imbue um, new habits into existing structures, we start to associate those existing habits, brushing our teeth. I get up, I brush my teeth every morning, and then I might do a guided meditation. It starts to become automatic. And I don't want anyone to have, have to go out there and sort of reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of these very um, common transition points that we can find throughout our day. And so I, I want people to understand and have a formation is that we need to utilize what we have to make the process as easy, as simple as possible. So the first principle being make it easy, start with a very low intensity, build compliance. And the second um, sort of habit principle is to, to go with what you already have, stack it on top of what you already have, and you will find yourself automatically flowing to this new behavior over time. All right. And moving on to our last sort of habits and their formations here. We're about 31 minutes right now. So tracking well within our time frame. And if we end up going a little bit over, feel free um, to excuse yourself from the webinar and uh, totally understandable and just appreciate you all spending some time in your evening with me um, in this webinar. And so to begin here, um, we're talking about what we sort of covered a little bit earlier is um, the big foundational principles of not only therapy, but of effective relationships are empathy and self-compassion. Self-compassion can go either way. We can be compassionate towards others. We can be compassionate towards ourselves. Compassion towards ourselves is, is one of the hardest things I see, excuse me, patients struggling with when they're, when they're talking with me. And it, it is very hard to be vulnerable to our inner world and, and to understand and to be kind to ourselves. No one is really stopping us from self-criticism, being angry, being enraged, sort of lashing ourselves when we might perceive a failure. And so stopping that process can, can actually take a long time. And um, that, that is a very, very challenging habit to put in. And that can typically, typically uncover a lot of struggling emotions and relational trauma that the person has experienced, typically throughout their development into their adolescent period. But I sort of want to get us redirected here to talking about empathy. Um, again, empathy is understanding or sharing in the feelings of another. Empathy is not, I repeat, it is not trying to solve the problem or to make them feel better. And sort of a tip on, on, on empathy and approaching in a relationship is when you approach a loved one, it, it's good to just simply be curious about what is going on. And when you empathize, you're sort of trying to locate the source of this pain or fear or discomfort. And you're letting them know through this curiosity, through this discovery process, that they're, that how they feel is important. It's important enough for you to ask questions about and to be curious about, and that this problem is typically worthwhile and soothing, that the person feels heard, they feel seen by the person, and they feel felt by another once they're able to connect and express what they're struggling with in that moment. And so just again, knowing and connecting is this real focus rather than doing or solving. That's typically the struggle that I see a lot of males have in communication with their spouses. They go for the solution a little bit more where someone is typically not looking for a solve. They know how to solve. Solutions are typically the easiest thing you can come up with um, for a problem, but they are just looking to be felt, to be seen, to be empathized with, to understand that they're struggling and suffering with something that is hard for them to go through. And so human beings, again, you know, sort of touched on this earlier as well, can bear an incredible amount of stress and challenge through connection, but we can only take on very, very little when we're isolated. Any of these, any feelings of safety and connection and curiosity that you provide for a loved one, for a child, for a family member, for a friend, a coworker, you help this person become stronger in the face of adversity, stronger, not weaker, because we are able to bear more 
together than we are alone as human beings. We are interdependent creatures from the day we are born to the day we are die. True independence is not something that really exists um, with human beings. It's not something that's ever going to really exist. We are very social creatures. We are very, very dependent on one another for our emotional needs. And so moving forward to compassion, compassion for others and self-compassion um, up top there. Compassion is this choice to be kind to ourselves when we struggle or are vulnerable. And we, when we choose to be kind to ourselves in this moment, we are choosing to cultivate a better and more positive relationship with ourselves. Again, we're placing a value. We're saying that compassion is a good thing. If we're able to be kind to ourselves, if we're able to remain in that parasympathetic rest and digest state, if we're able to self-soothe, that's a good action. That's, that promotes our long-term emotional and physical health rather than being indifferent or not taking action, action. That's a more neutral stance towards yourself. And we can be very cruel to ourselves. We can lash ourselves. We can be very upset and angry and take it out on ourselves in different ways. This is what I see typically promotes uh, states of anxiety, states of depression, uh, more states of, uh, paras of, excuse me, sympathetic fight and flight activation not as good for our long-term health. And so again, which state would you like to cultivate? Not only in others, in your family, in, or in your friend group, in uh, with your coworkers, but how would you like to co cultivate that experience for yourself? And a lot, one of the biggest like challenges and, and hangups I see with self-compassion is um, people who are really into self-esteem. And so, when, when, when we decide to be kind to ourselves, one, one of the criticisms is, well, how will I ever get better? How will I ever push forward? And actually the research shows that self-compassion has about, um, it has the same benefits as self-esteem. Um, uh, and self-esteem being confidence that you get through accomplishments. And so it has the same benefits as self-esteem, but it doesn't have those negative drawbacks because when we're driven um, purely by or mostly by these external rewards, these accomplishments, then we can sort of fuel our drive, our motivation with a very cruel, a very um, oftentimes sadistic viewpoint towards ourselves. If we do not get that promotion, if we don't um, ask the girl out on a date, if we're not doing what we need to do, if we're not being perceived in a certain way, we will be very angry at ourselves and lash ourselves towards that finish line there. And I, I see that time and time again in front of me, people being really ravaged, not only by um, relational dysfunction, but also its internalization that ends up showing up as a very negative and critical shaming voice. And so just a word on, on self-compassion versus self-esteem and what I, how I want people to understand the, the concept of uh, self-compassion, compassion for others is that it's typically easier to do for others than it's easier to do for ourselves. And so what I like people to start with is to start with others and then to work backwards towards yourself. What would, what would a friend say to me if I were struggling with this or if I didn't know what to do? What would I say to a loved one? We can sort of place ourselves in the shoes of another, someone who loves us, understands us, and has a non-judgmental stance, someone who we will typically feel very safe with. And just imagine, what would they say to me to, to, to sort of um, be able to get some inspiration of what can I say to myself right now in this struggle? And so a, a big part of habit formation as well, transitioning to that, right now, just keeping it very simple, is how can we make this action satisfying? And so one, one, one thing we want to do, again, is to embed this in a structure, in a habit that already exists. One of the easiest times to develop something like self-compassion is when you are with, with a loved one and you can sort of do it with each other. Um, if someone makes a dinner 
you can point that out, that that was very kind of them. If you make dinner, you can say you feel ha pretty happy with yourself. And this could be a good time in your day if you, if you enjoy dinner with your family to be able to develop a habit in that, something that's already existing, but to be able to encourage people to say, what, what's one thing that you enjoyed about yourself today? What was a struggle today? Um, how was that hard and how did you try to resolve this? Did you have a difficult feeling that you experienced today? That might get a little bit um, too ooey gooey at the dinner table, but we can at least start something, start with something like what's something you struggled with and how did you overcome it today? How were you kind to yourself? How were you kind to another? To, to help people start understanding and talking about and getting a lot of repetitions with what they can say to themselves and others, how they can be compassionate and empathetic towards themselves and towards other people to cultivate states and feelings of safety, connection, um, loving, trust, and um, being able to have faith in ourselves and our peers, our our family, um, and uh, our coworkers in that way. And so, moving on to some of the benefits of psychotherapy, here we're getting a little bit closer to time. And so I'll move us through here quickly. And so some of the benefits I have today, this is this webinar and these webinars, I'm gonna be doing these every three weeks, um, is just to provide you some really great information. Um, all this has ev uh, is evidence-based material, even the habit formation stuff is all grounded in, in, in some good evidence. Um, but some of the, this is a jumping off point. I don't expect anybody to be an expert in this right now or to be able to take this and seamlessly implement this into their daily life. And so one of the biggest benefits I give is that I'm able to teach mindful breathing. I imbue it very centrally to my therapeutic process. It is just such a powerful tool in being able to cultivate awareness in the self to be able to make some of these changes. And my ultimate goal in therapy is that I, I very much enjoy the process. I enjoy connecting, helping the person in that hour. But the more I can empower people with these skills and help them move as a more powerful agent within the world, someone who ends up being a lot more emotionally resilient by going through this process, um, that, that's the real thing that I'm after. How can I help this person help themselves, help their families? And I feel like that is the greatest impact I can give to the most amount of people. Um, another thing I do is I talk about um, embedding healthy habits. Um, a lot of people struggle at this point. This is one of the biggest barriers to sort of harvesting and getting the benefits of something like mindful breathing, journaling, empathy, and self-compassion. And what we do really matters for that. If we can learn how to grow and cultivate, we can really learn how to do anything that we want. And so I try to really work with people on embedding habits in a non-judgmental approach. You would be really surprised at how many people have some pretty strong feelings of shame when they say they're going to meditate to me. They're very excited about it. And they come back in the next week and they say, I literally just remembered it on the walk up. And, and I hope you're not upset. And so I give a very non-judgmental and calm and intentional approach. And I'm here to give you a very consistent presentation that's going to facilitate you being able to talk about things that are difficult and hard, things that you might be ashamed of or uncertain of, and to help you understand this in, in some different ways um, with some of, uh, of the experience that I, I have uh, garnered over my years in this work. And the, the last thing being empathy and self-compassion. A lot of times people end up, one of the biggest benefits I would say of therapy is that, um, and principles that work, and I see work all the time in therapy, is that what, what is first external but then becomes internal. Um, this, this happens in development with children. Um, we see with, with people, with a parent at a grocery store, a child is crying, and then the parent, um, hopefully if they're a very effective and secure parent, um, even though all parents uh, can struggle in those moments, and, and I don't blame them for that, because um, children are very, very difficult to manage consistently, but we, we can sort of see the child is upset. They, they're not able to regulate their emotions. That is up to the parent to help them regulate their emotions. Dr. Shane uh, Stedman has a great uh, phrase I like to use is that your parents 
when your child are like your frontal lobe. They're, they're the source of the higher human behaviors. They help you cultivate and internalize, hopefully healthy coping mechanisms. And so if there's a parent that, uh, that sees the child, goes over there, um, uh, helps the child understand that they understand that they're upset, they soothe them, they calm them, this external action from their environment gets internalized over time. And so if we have dysfunctional patterns of self-soothing and calming, then we can surely understand that uh, we will internalize this over time. And so why I'm so um, explaining this is because empathy and self-compassion and compassion in general is something that a lot of a lot of people, a lot of patients end up not receiving enough of in their daily life. And that's one of the biggest benefits of of individual therapy. I'm trained in a very relational approach as well. So I provide a lot of empathy, a lot of understanding. Um, I've sort of seen it and heard it all at this point. There's nothing anybody's going to say that's really, that's going to throw me for a loop or something that I have not heard before. And I'm able to give the person a lot of compassion in these very vulnerable moments that they bring to me. These, these things that they might have not said out loud to anyone else. And this is a very delicate and precious moment that, that can happen. And what we return that with as therapists and also as people, what we can start to do is to give compassion, to give kindness to that person in that moment. So again, over time, they're able to start internalizing this for themselves. And so those are the biggest benefits of psychotherapy that I see in terms of these habit formations. It's very directly tied into a lot of my daily work. And, and moving on to sort of some benefits um, of psychotherapy, just with our current uncertainty, and I wanted to keep this in here because we're in a really unprecedented time right now. Um, you know, these it's getting very strangely normal right now and, and, and things will also start opening up soon and just things will be very uncertain for a long period of time. So what I want people to understand walking away from this is that um, going to psychotherapy, um, going to me, um, someone else, uh, getting with a qualified professional that you have a good fit with is that you have an experienced guide. We, we're sort of used to dropping into people's inner worlds, their, their unconscious on a daily basis um, everyone is unique in their in the in the personal sense and how that terrain is formulated, but all the principles work the same person to person, um, ex experience to experience. And so you have someone that's that's trained and, and understands the terrain of what people are going through, what how the unconscious develops, how the people's emotional health develops and changes, how tra traumas and relational traumas can affect our, our life and, and things of this nature. And so having that experience guide is just very critical um, to having uh, someone help you through this uncertainty, uh, through healthy habit formation, things that we talked about earlier as well. Um, the second big benefit I see is to learn from within. You're learning from your own experience. I'm here, I, I, I've developed a knowledge base. I've learned a lot more in my time in integrated health systems as well. Um, but ultimately the process is up to you and you need to learn from within and I'm only facilitating and helping to guide and manage that for you. And what we find a lot is that people come into therapy very isolated, um, very ashamed, they, they're struggling with something um, and they're on their edge in, in their ability to cope. And so they're feeling all out of sorts, they're feeling very broken usually. And so this third big benefit I see is that you're regaining or strengthening your sense of self through this process. It is very amazing to see what can happen as in short as six weeks of individual therapy combined with the therapies that Dr. Stedman and Dr. Perry um, are giving the nutritional changes that they facilitate as well, the supplementation changes that happen, and the emotional changes that begin to happen. Um, I've seen some very incredible transformations at my time at IHS. Um, I've seen people regain their health where they, they were struggling for several years um, or, or decades with their health. And it's really an amazing process to not only see, but to be a part of as well. And sort of in conclusion today, starting to wrap up, um, the, one of the big differences I want people to understand with habit formation and habits is the difference between knowing and the difference between doing. Um, you got a lot of great information today. Um, you sort of like, it, it, it's like getting a map. 
And what we also need, but it's very different to look at a map and, but to also walk through and navigate that, um, that habit formation again is as, um, is as important as the habits themselves. And they, they have a very inner intertwined connection with each other. We cannot have one without the other in that sense. And the second thing, and what I like to say to people as uh, individual therapy is growing in popularity and also in quality because so much great evidence, um, uh, evidence-based treatments are out there now that the field is really progressing and maturing at a very rapid rate is that this is the time, this is um, the space where this is opening up and being okay. And it's more okay, more okay than it's ever been. And that we just simply need to be frank about our emotional health. I was on, um, the radio program yesterday, Haystack Radio. Um, and, and one of the practitioners, I'm on there every three weeks. Um, and we do a half hour spot on like, uh, from 1230 to one on Mondays, there's going to be a slide. The next slide, we'll cover that a little bit more, but that, it going in, going to therapy, you know, hopefully one day it will be as common as getting our, our tires rotated on the car, getting our oil changed, just something that's very serviceable, something that's reliable and, and something that's very available and common to us because it's just that fundamental and important of a need. This is a time period right now that we're all living in that we are able to sort of free ourselves of intergenerational traumas, um, traumas that we experienced. Um, very, very difficult existential issues we might be going through, depression, anxiety, the whole gamut of pathologies that people suffer, suffer from, something that older generations had to suffer from because there simply was not the access or knowledge that's so prevalent now. And we can simply be frank about our emotional health. We can get the help we need and we can become stronger in our emotional world. And moving on to sort of what we're putting out there every Monday from 12.30 to 1, uh, 1 p.m. Um, we're on KLC The Source. I was just on there yesterday. Um, it's a great radio program that's sponsored by Integrated Health Systems that we talk about different topics. Um, I will be on again in, in three weeks, and I'll be doing another webinar as well, um, most likely geared a little bit more towards what people are going to start experiencing sort of depression from so social isolation and continued uncertainty. But through this time right now, what we really want to do in Integrated Health Systems is to create a lot of content um, and, to, and to be a, a support for our patients and the uncertainty that, that they are going through and their families at large are going through. I would really, really encourage you, if you have a family member, friend, or yourself, um, we can get to this last slide um, that we do have telehealth available as well. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with coming into the office, very easy to set up. Um, all you need is a decent internet connection and we can uh, start treatment um, as soon as as uh, as soon as you would like um, from the comfort of your home and the safety of your home at this time. But just to get back to that one point before I get off it is that um, I want to encur encourage you all to if you need a consult um, and consults are, are absolutely free, you can go ahead and click that link in the uh, in the attendee chat um, that was posted at the beginning. Um, it's 30 minutes. There's no strings attached. Um, you can click that link and find a time. If none of those times work for you, you can go ahead and call this number here um, or Google Integrated Health Systems Denver um, afterwards if, if you're not able to find a time or don't have a pen on ha hand. And what we really want to do during this time is just to support our patients, um, to support people starting conversations about their physical and mental health, how their physical health impacts their emotional health and vice versa. And and how we can do whatever we can through content, pushing this conversation, trying to pull people in to in order to promote the best health we can um, through this time of crisis that we're going through. And so that'll conclude this for tonight. I'll be doing another one in, in three weeks time here. I'll also be back on the radio as well. Um, really, really appreciate you all spending time with me. I know I went, I went about 10 minutes over today, so I, I see people are still here. So very, very much appreciated. If you have any uh, questions or concerns, please just go ahead 
uh, and, and schedule a consultation for you or a family member. Um, and I'm willing to talk to more than one person um, because starting a conversation, especially about our mental health, can still be a big struggle for people. These are conversations I have day in and day out. I, I'm trained and ready to go and, and how to help facilitate making someone comfortable enough to start talking about themselves and and, and start to talk about things and, and help me be aware of things that they've been struggling maybe for a long time or maybe even their entire lifetime. So again, um, thank you all very much. Um, click the link if you'd like, and I will see you all again in three weeks time here. All right, you all have a good evening, and that'll be the conclusion of this.